Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Healing Circle Podcast. I am Kobe. I'm Kyle. And we're so excited to be back for season five yeah, of yeah, yeah. the podcast. I knew you were going to make that I sound. I did. Yeah, I was going to do that. We are here with video. You see us now. We are in our living room because we have an amazing team who are all physically present here. You should see them. They're all very fly individuals. Yes. Um, we're so grateful for them to help us level up our content and connect us deeper with you guys. So uh, this is season five um, between season four and this season. <laughs> there's been like a couple changes. Yeah. A couple of changes. Well, a whole pandemic. Um, Pandoramic. Do we have another kid since then? No, no, no. no. That remember. was the last season. That was the last season. The kids just keep coming. No, they so. don't. <laughs> I rebuked that in the name of Jesus. Um, I don't know what time it is for the listeners. Here it is hang time. Anyways. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> between. Between. <laughs> between. So if, don't check your watches, y'all. I it's can't. hang time. Between you see it? last time and this time, oh, Kyle grew his up. hair out. He's very proud of it. You're probably hearing his little rubber band swish in the mic. Um, I can't. I was like, I was really listening intently because I thought that you were going to say yeah. something of value. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's hang time. Something of worth. I was just like, oh, he's really going to yeah. share something with them. Nope. Don't matter if it's Eastern, Mountain, I you know, cannot. Pacific. It's hang time everywhere. I'm done with you. So, um, the last season, well, one, I've, I, season four, did I do that by myself? I did. You guys. Uh, season three was reparenting, right? Yeah. And one. then I, I like jumped back in cause I was like, I'm going to do this by myself without Kyle because Kyle was just super busy and going through lots of career transitions. And then we were just kind of thinking about it and we were like, you know what? We miss doing this podcast together. So I was doing the Ask Kobe where you guys submit questions or a voicemail if you're feeling a little spicy. And I play it and then respond back to you, um, kind of like old school column style. But what we're going to do is we're going to move that, the Ask Kobe, to my membership community, the Inner Circle. If you want to join a membership community of amazing, amazing people, you should for sure join uh, the Inner Circle. The link will be in the show notes. All that good stuff, but I want to get into what we're talking about today. And then last season, um, where me and Kyle were together, we talked a lot about like awareness of mental health, being aware that you have codependence, aware that you're a mess, aware that you know you have trauma or anxiety, where um, you fit in the family system and what that dynamic looks like, and yeah. how it um, impacts your daily world, right? For sure. And um, I'm realizing um, in my work on social media, um, as I write my book, all the good things that there's still kind of like a little bit of a gap between understanding that something's wrong and then like knowing what to do with it. Right. And so as Kyle and I were like processing what we wanted to do for this season, we were kind of talking about the idea that like we want to start talking about like okay you're aware something is wrong like what do you do with it now and so like that's kind of what the season is going to be about it's like what do I do with what I know I know something's wrong because that's the worst place to be <laughs> to know that there's a problem and have no clue what to do with the problem that is like torture yeah everyone who lived through the pandemic probably got to the other side being like I'm not okay. Yeah, uh, and and not just I'm not okay. I'm not okay, and I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> yeah. Which is like, and time for me to just throw myself back into deep dysfunction because what else am I supposed to do, right? So um, this season is about providing resources, about connecting with you guys a little deeper, about talking about what do I do with the fact that I'm realizing that I have this pain. And so Kyle and I were like talking to yesterday day before yesterday either way you don't even know what i'm referencing it, it, so yeah. it's okay um, yes <laughs> we were talking about like when you realize something is wrong when you realize that you're in pain when you realize that you have trauma or deep wounds that need to like be addressed specifically for christians there's like this hope that there is like a a one-size-fits-all solution to any of your mental health issues which is like I have Jesus. Yeah. Like I, but I have Jesus or, or like 
there's a trend going on um, on social media and like it's like people kind of sharing the before and after of them being saved. And the implication is like before I knew Jesus, life was terrible. Life was trash. I was busting it wide open. A, B, C, D, F, G. Right. And then like the implication is like then I said yes to Jesus and mm-hmm. like all of a sudden, yep, like my credit score went up, my face cleared up. I don't got acne no more. All I wear is Brooks Brothers. Yeah. Like it's just like very like, and I get what people are trying to communicate, but I feel like what people miss is like mm, I don't know the truth. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, saying yes to Jesus does not mean that you don't experience pain. Saying yes to Jesus does not mean that your pain is resolved. Saying yes to Jesus does not mean that your life gets easier. Right. It gets better. But the standard at which it gets better is not defined by the world's standards, which yeah. is usually an easier life, a funner life, right? a happier life. And that's like a hard truth for people to hold on to. And that doesn't mean that God doesn't desire for us to have those good things. It just means that saying yes to him does not automatically give it to you. Like when I talk to my Christian clients about like an analogy between saying yes to Jesus and going to therapy, Like saying yes to Jesus does not mean you know how to live with Jesus. Saying yes to your spouse does not mean you know how to live with them. For the people in the back, say it again, babe. (laughs) Say it again. Saying yes to your spouse, to Jesus, to whoever. Saying yes to someone, committing to someone does not mean you know how to do every day with them. Yeah. Becoming aware of your trauma, becoming aware that there's a problem does not mean that you have the capacity to live as a healed person. It just means you know the problem. You know, like that's, that's literally it. It just means that, you know, the problem that doesn't mean you know how to live outside of the problem or operate outside of the problem. And I think a lot of Christian people are struggling Hear my heart. I think a lot of us are struggling with seeing people who aren't in Christ experience a freedom that we think that we should experience, but we don't want to do the work that they've done. Yep. We don't want to go to therapy. We don't want to go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. We don't want to be honest about our pain because we're so busy masking, right? Like speak to things as that are not as though they are like Mm -hmm. that. Let the poor man say that he is rich. Let the sick man say that he's healed, which is all great. And you should do that. It is beautiful. And there's a point in your story in which you should adopt that perspective of prophetically taking claim of what God has spoken over you. But before you get there, you have to actually acknowledge the level of pain that you're in. Yeah. And to pause for the cause, this happens in culture because the way that we're taught about Jesus is the way that we then live them out. That's just, that's how everyone does everything. Yeah. So what happens is, We have communities of well-meaning people who skip over the problems in the stories. They skip over the weeping Jesus who is crying over his friend who is dead, who he's about to raise to life. Right. So but we'll tell people, like, don't cry over spilled milk. But we see a Jesus who cries over something he's about to fix. Right. So what do we do with that? Yeah. There's a whole narrative in scripture that where God is leaning into the pain of the story but we as Christians read that out of it. Mm-hmm. So then we teach Christians that to be Christian is to skip over the pain. Yeah. Just go straight to preaching. Go straight to like, oh, but he rose from the tomb. But there's a whole lot of stuff in between that. There's yeah. a whole day too where everyone thinks Jesus is a liar. Yeah. Where they think he's gone and he's yeah. dead and he's never coming back. Yep. We skip to day three where he's resurrected and everything's cool. And, we and then we cheer. teach people in yeah. their own life that you have to skip day two. You have to skip the hard part or you're not being a real Christian. So that's what's, like, that's part of, you know, that's part of what's happening, right? So part of what we got to do is redefine what it even means to be a believer, because it's not belief in this God who's going to rescue you from every hard thing. It's a belief in a God who's going to be with you in the middle of your hard things. Those are two very different realities. And I think that when we skip over, like, the day two and the story of, like, resurrection and the story of redemption, we find that like generalized to our real lives because we skip over things like or dismiss the value of things like therapy because therapy is what you need in the day two. Therapy is what you need when it's dark and you can't hear anybody when you're frustrated, when you're depressed, when you're anxious, when it feels like there's no hope. Like that's where those resources come in. But if you're so busy, one of my (laughs) biggest pet peeves 
One of my biggest pet peeves is when worship leaders say, I don't care how you feel. I know a guy and I'm oh, it always yanks me out of worship because I'm like, that's not true. God actually cares how I feel. I, I get what you're trying to like spiritually like like encourage me into, but you're literally just using language that validates that God doesn't care about the whole human experience. And he does care about the whole human experience, right? And so, yeah. like, for a lot of us, we we want to skip over to the solution. But that's not even how Jesus lives. Jesus is not solution-oriented. Like, he's oriented about around presence, around being with you. And I think that, like, when I serve people of faith, um, and not just Christians, people of all faith, it's really hard to conceptualize a world where I have to do something about the pain that I'm in and it won't be immediately resolved. Yeah. And then you start to self-shame, right? Oh, yeah. So there's something wrong with me, me, especially because in the social media age, everyone else's story is the one where they realize something is wrong. They kind of worked hard for a week or two and then everything got better. And so then you feel like you're the outlier. Yeah. Like, oh, no, man, I, you know, I've been in therapy for what, five years now. Yeah. I ain't but barely better than I was five years ago. <laughs> no, I'm I'm in a much, much better place. But even like yeah. even the story of like my personal therapy journey, yeah. I didn't want to go. Kobe made me go. I yeah. had some bad therapists. Yeah. I had some good therapists. I had yeah. some bad therapists. I wasn't bought in at seasons. Then I was bought in. Yeah. Um and for like three years it was kinda like, man, what am I doing? And then I had some breakthroughs. Yeah. And then everything sort of started snowballing from there. And now I still have to come back and say, okay. What happens in healing is that you, for the most part, you begin to realize how broken you are. Yeah. Right? So, you know, it's not this thing. It's not a destination. You talk about that all the time. Healing is not a destination. It's, it's a, a journey. journey. Um, and it's really easy to fake the other way. Yeah. People get famous off of faking being healed. It's like, it's like when you see on Instagram when it's like, homeless man now is a millionaire. Or like child that was mercilessly beaten now owns four houses and it's like <laughs> do the four houses somehow correlate to his mental his mental and emotional health because now he just got four houses and some trauma mm -hmm. like i think we often try to use physical things the measure of physical things to measure how healed we are emotionally and like that's just not the case if someone's super rich after experiencing heinous childhood trauma they're just rich with childhood trauma you know, they're just rich with with lots of pain. They have more stuff, but it doesn't change how much pain that they're in. Um, and, you know, like with my story with coming to faith, I had an incredible, miraculous moment with the Lord. Um, I was depressed. I was suicidal. It was like I was just like, God, what is the point of this? What is the point of life? Are you even real? Had a ma 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 wow, miraculous, miraculous, miraculous moment with the Lord. And I was like on this spiritual, emotional high, like God is good, God is real, dang, I can't believe God's really real, God's really real, he sees me, he sees me, he wants me, he knows me, he desires me, all these things. And then life happened. God is not going to to like make the world not the world. Mm -hmm. One thing about life, it's gonna keep life in. It's gonna life, okay? It's going to drag you, it's gonna yoke you up like a middle school bully, period. Doesn't matter what you believe, you know? Yeah, and like. Schoolers. <laughs> and especially the eighth graders, man, they're mean. Bro, why so mean? <laughs> right, that's another podcast. Kids are mean really? for a reason, though. But okay, Go yeah. Ahead. But you know, like, I was confused because, like, when I started talking to other Christians, their response was like, "Well, you're not praying enough," or like, "Well, you, I saw you miss Bible study." Or like, why didn't you go to, you know, this this prayer gathering or this retreat? And like and like I think one of the most painful things I've heard, and you know this, is someone saying, like, hey, you need to cheer up because your depression is ruining your witness of how good God is. And I think that that phrase ooh, there we go. Even that, the mic didn't like it. The <laughs> mic was saying, I <laughs> I rebuke it. <laughs> yeah. Um, that phrase, even though people may not have the words for it, I think that phrase haunts so many people, the sentiment of it. Mm -hmm. Like I have to somehow I am in control of God's PR and I have to make it look like he's good, even though I am in so much pain, even though I have so many deep wounds. And for me, I, one of the things I'm really proud of is I just didn't lie. I like I felt tempted to though. I felt yeah. tempted to be like, 
God is good all the time, you know, like, but the truth was I was in pain. And so I saved up, you know, my, my cafeteria money and I found a therapist with a sliding scale and I ran across college road in Wilmington, North Carolina to go to a therapist when everyone told me that there was just something wrong with me. And yeah, there was something wrong with me and it, but it wasn't what I was doing. It was about what happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. Like no one had really cared to even ask what happened to me. And then, and me little soapbox, we end up having leaders in the church who think that their anointing somehow like eliminates their trauma when really you're, you can be anointed and traumatized. And oftentimes that's the worst mix because now you're using your anointing to validate why you shouldn't heal. Now you're using your anointing to validate why you can treat people the way you treat them. And now you're using your anointing to validate why you don't deserve more. This is not even about how you treat people. It's about you, Mm -hmm. God wanting more for you. There's a fuller life that God has for you, a life where you uh, are more of who he's called you to be and anointed, not just mean and anointed. Bruh. You know? And there's something in the air up there, right? Like we all, we, yeah, for sure. If I say ex pastor did X and ruined his whole witness and now the church is broken up you don't know who it is you just know it could be 50 dudes that just ran through your mind right so there's something in the air up there and i think we know what it is it's arrogance yeah it's not bad people it's good people who think that their goodness means that they don't have to do the work to investigate their own story oh my goodness right like so it's not you know it's not a bunch no one gets to um no one decides to shepherd people in life, in any aspect, just being like some horrible person. Everyone's the hero of their own story, right? The story we're all telling, I'm the hero. Yeah. Now, I may do bad things, but in my mind, Lord, uh, in my mind, (laughs) when I do the bad things, I'm doing them for good reasons. They have good outcomes. There's a plan, right? So everyone who ends up falling and some sort of issue, like no one gets there just decide, yeah, today I'm going to be the worst version of myself. Yeah. But when you believe the hype, about who you are this is so dangerous i hate i hate the way we talk to gifted people in church especially young people because we tell them that their gifting means that they have character and so we impute on them all of the things that wisdom and patience and all that stuff gives you just because you're 15 and can sing or you can play or whatever what whatever it's 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 not good but ultimately it's a form of arrogance it's just the idea that because i'm gifted i don't have problems yeah and my ability to communicate, my ability to get people on my side is proof that I'm okay. Yeah. And it's, it's not. The devil can do the same thing. Yeah. So clearly, your ability to get people to say that you say good stuff, your ability to get people to follow you on Instagram, your ability to move people's opinions has nothing to do with whether or not you're actually okay. <laughs> and, and you know, I... I will like not challenge, but like kind of like reframe what a little bit of what you said. I think we, because we don't understand psychology, anything that is easily understood is oversimplified. Yeah. You know, anything that you can just kind of like, there's always nuance that we miss. Right. So I feel like we often run to the idea of an overinflated ego. Oh my gosh, like that person's ego is so big. Ego, ego, and like we make ego the enemy, right? I've been on the soapbox for so many years. Have you been following me for a long time? You know I've been talking about this in 2016. Like we make ego, excuse me, the enemy. But the truth is ego's not the enemy. Most people that we think have inflated egos actually have underdeveloped egos, right? Because they don't believe the hype about themselves. That's why they have to do so much. That's mm-hmm. why they have to convince you of so much. That's why they need so much to define them. It's because they actually don't believe the hype about themselves. Yeah. They just need you to believe the hype about themselves. And you believing it is is enough to them. Yeah. You know, like, I need you to believe I'm something because I don't believe I'm something. Right? And so, like... Many times I think that people have an underdeveloped ego and are afraid to develop healthy ego, which is a healthy sense of self, a a healthy belief of self, because they are afraid that they're going to come off as someone who has like an inflated ego. Right. And I also want to say this, like I say this, um, I mentioned this in my book and I've also said this to clients like shameless plug. Why am I like this out? April, uh, 2023. Just saying, go ahead. Yes. Um, 
people always say like, oh, well, I've gone this long and I'm fine. I've gone this long and I'm okay. Or like, I've gone this long. I don't need nothing. I don't need no therapy. I don't need da 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 da. And, you know, I ask them like, when you're hungry, if you don't eat, do you get more or less hungry? Hmm. If I'm in need of something and I continue to withhold it from myself, do I get more or less hungry? I get more hungry. If anything, I start to become starved. It's the same thing with our emotional health. Just because you haven't had it before doesn't mean you shouldn't give it to yourself in the future. And if anything, when you withhold food for too long, you it literally starvation can lead you into delusion. Yeah. And there are a lot of people that are spiritually and emotionally delusional Mm -hmm. because they've been starving for so long. And people are putting plates of food in front of them. Come on, saying please eat like eat, eat for free, eat without cost, drink without cost. And they're like, no, I'm used to starving. So let me continue to starve. Mm-hmm. And and they're missing the fact that like the delusions that they have held on to because they've withheld good things from themselves for so long affect other people. Yeah. You know, it's like a drunk driver. You get behind the wheel, you're drunk, but you're putting everyone in your proximity at risk. Like the people who have those like that, that mentality of like, I haven't eaten in 10 years. And it's like, OK, so, so then you actually probably need some really good food right now. Yeah, that's how you, you know? get people whose parents were um, for whatever reason, they had their own story, but were basically just absent parents, maybe present physically, but absent emotionally. Yeah. Didn't hug them, didn't kiss them, didn't talk to them about their feelings, just kind of dictated what they needed to do to not be an inconvenience. And then they grow up and like, you know, they're 40, they're 50 and they live their life as if that's normal yeah. and that's healthy and that's yeah. good. So when their children want more affection, want more attention, it's like, no, there's something wrong with you that you want all of this attention from me. Oh, yeah. It's like, well, no, no, actually, there's something wrong with you that you think I don't need this much attention. Yeah. Right. But but that's what happens. Right. You stop eating, your stomach shrinks. So then you survive off of less and less fills you up. But that doesn't mean that you're eating enough. Yeah. It just means that, okay, well, I haven't eaten in so long that this piece of broccoli is doing it for me. Mm. But surviving isn't thriving, right? Yeah. And, like, we're, we're trying to help move the needle, move the culture forward towards a place where we can say, okay, I didn't get what I needed 10 years ago. That just means I need it more now. Yeah. Not, oh, well, I've, I've learned to do without it. Oh my God. And I think that is, like, a huge part of the reason why we really have to like gain a deeper and broader understanding of like what trauma is. Right. And I go over this in my book. So when I talk to uh, churches, organizations, excuse me, people um, at all, when they're like, okay, well, where's trauma in scripture? Like, I I don't see this in the Bible. And like mental health practitioners are so needed in the body of Christ because there is a perspective and an insight that we have about scripture um, that other people just don't see, not because they're lazy or don't study hard enough. They just have, that's just not where they're anointed. That's just not where they're, they're gifted. So when people ask me like, okay, where's trauma in scripture? I automatically always go to Genesis two and three, you know, this, the whole spiel. I used to have a Bible study I used to do on this. So in Genesis two, uh, I think it's verse like 15, it starts with verse 15. Um, God's creating the earth, he creates all the things, animals, da, 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 da. then he creates Adam, right? He creates Adam and he tells him, verse 15, um, puts him in there to work it and take care of it. What does that tell us about God? It tells us that God trusts Adam, that yep. he puts things of value in Adam's hands. Um, and then uh, verse 16, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um for if you eat of it, you'll certainly die, right? People see them like, oh, well, why is the tree there? And I'm like, for me, I'm like, oh, what does that say about God? It says that God values freedom. He says you're free to eat. But also God values Adam's life, mm-hmm. right? The goal is not to limit him, but to protect and preserve his life, right? Um, then verse 18, he says, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. He cares about Adam being lonely, Right. Yeah. And you said this before, like loneliness is probably one of the first and only negative emotions that's captured in scripture. That's pre fall. Yeah. Pre before the devil enters the scene, man is lonely. Yeah. So and if you're a believer and you love Jesus and you're lonely, 
Doesn't mean you're sinful. Yeah. It means you're human. Yeah. There's there is something wrong when you're alone. Now, yeah. obviously, you know, there's nuance there, but for sure, for it's sure. not a sin. Yeah. Longing for connection uh, does not make does not mean that you're, you know, in idolatry and <laughs> does not mean that you're sinful. This, like it's actually God, God acknowledges that and makes provision for that. Right. And we see that in verse 18. Right. Um, And then verse 19 to 20, he literally gives Adam the freedom to name all the animals, all the livestock. What does that tell us? Tell us about God's intention for the world and for Adam. Well, that he trusts Adam with creativity. Yeah. God could have said, I care about you being obedient. So make sure that you name each animal this specific thing. Except he says, I want to see what you come up with. I want you to be creative. I want you to have free reign to express yourself the way that you want to express yourself. Right? Well, and it tells us that God ultimately desires that we be like him. Yeah. Right? So all the things God does, he then equips Adam to do. So yep. a lot of us have grown up under this belief that this there is a God up there who wants to restrict us from being all that we can be. Yeah. That That's not how he's oriented. Right. So he's after us being more like him. Yep. Yep. And uh, verse 23, after he makes uh, Eve, um, the first thing Adam says, I love this, smoothest line ever. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. That's a bar. (laughs) Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, right? She should be called woman for she's taken out of man. What is it he's saying? He's saying you are a part of me. You like me and you are like this. You are a part of me. We are together, right? And he sees the similarity between him and Eve, right? Then the fall happens, which I'm promising I'm going to try not to make this really long because Kyle knows I can get on my soapbox about this, right? So It's a good soapbox. Oh, before we get to uh, the fall in uh, chapter 3, verse 25 says, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. They felt Amen. no shame about who they were, what they look like, nothing. They they felt no shame, right? So then chapter three comes along. The serpent comes in and the serpent says, uh, did God really say you must not eat of the tree of the garden? The woman says to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees, but God did uh, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. And he says, you will certainly not die. And the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from him, uh, so if you, when you eat from it, uh, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing what is good and what is evil, right? What we see right there is manipulation, right? He, t- he takes the language of what, God, of what God communicates and he manipulates it to make it seem like God is restricting instead of God making space for freedom, right? So the woman sees it and she eats of it. Eve, we forgive you. She eats of it, and then what happens, right? Gives them to her husband, and then um, they hear the Lord in the cool of the day, and uh, God says, where are you? He already knew, right? But he's asking to illuminate the fact that they're they're hiding from him, right? Um, and then Adam says, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And then he says, who told you you were naked? Um, have you eaten from the tree? And the woman said, and the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit to eat. Was this not the same man that just said bone on my bone and flesh on my flesh? It was. It was. And when I talk to people about trauma, I tell them everything you see in the second half of Genesis 2, there is like a grand reversal and you see the, the literal antithesis of it in three, right? It ends with saying that they were naked and felt no shame. All of a sudden, guess what? They're hiding because they feel shame. She's first bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And now she's the woman that you put me put here with me, right? And the woman literally gets like, she's thrown under the bus, right? She does make a mistake for sure. She's thrown under the bus. And, and now like this, this union is like broken, right? So when people say like, where's trauma in scripture? I'm like, it's in Genesis two or three. Everything you see of God's intent in Genesis two is either reversed or eliminated after Eve is manipulated, right? And I talk about creativity when he's supposed to like, you know, um, name the animals, name yeah. the animals. I'm like, where'd my brain go blank? When he's supposed to name the animals, but 
there is no creativity in Genesis 3. There's no creativity when you're traumatized and fearful. There's no creativity when you're afraid and shameful, right? The animals that they are meant to protect, the animals that they're meant to shepherd and name now become the thing that they kill to, to cover themselves up, right? Yeah. Or rather the, the leaves that cover themselves up, but God kills the animal to cover them up. But I want you to understand something. I want you to see some really quick. So, um, where is it? Uh, it's somewhere in chapter three. Anyways, you go down and God ends up covering them, kills an animal to cover them with the animal's hide, right? I think a lot of us think that God is like angry at our shame, that he's mocking our shame, that he's yeah. frustrated at us for feeling shameful or embarrassed. But like Genesis three shows us a God who actually says, oh, you're shameful. You're afraid to be seen. I will make you something to cover yourself. Instead of ripping it off and being like, stop being shameful. <laughs> I didn't make you that way. Yo, there's a black parent out there somewhere that <laughs> just said that, I swear. You know, like, I, I didn't create you that way. Let me just rip this off of you. And, and like, we, we want to always run straight to exposure therapy. We want to mm-hmm. run straight to, like, you feel afraid? Well, sit in the dark for three hours and, and you'll come out strong. But, like, that's not how God is. God's gentle. He says, like... You're shameful. Okay, the leaves are not enough. Let me let me cover you with something that's going to work a little bit better. And for a lot of us, we miss that the first trauma that ever happens in scripture had nothing to do with physical harm. Yeah. For all the people who want to be like, "Oh, it's just words or you need to stop caring what people say about you." It was with God's breath. Scripture calls it his ruah, that he created the universe. And you think that that same breath that's been put in us, that when we don't use it to speak ill against other people, that it doesn't traumatize them? Yeah, it's going to, it creates, right? So, and it always creates. Always. So when, when God spoke, it created. When Adam spoke, he began to create. Yeah. What we say to people is going to create something in them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it it's... It's just really interesting that so often the way that we metabolize this whole thing of being traumatized is about what we're not yeah, and about what we don't have, the mental fortitude. If I were stronger, if I were just a better dude, if I were just a better guy, if I were made different, then I'd, I don't know, I'd be better. And we miss... Like, Adam is supposed to be the prototype for what it means to be a human being. Yeah. So if the prototype for what it means to be a human being can hear one lie and it changed the course of history, one qu- not even a lie, a question, right? Because yeah. the, the question that the serpent brings in is, did God really say? Yep. Now, we don't think about that as trauma yep. normally. We don't think about, like, oh, the idea that someone comes in and simply asks a question that, that forces you to consider whether everything you know to be true might be a lie. Yeah. Even if the person who said the thing, God has not done anything yeah. to show himself unworthy. But the idea that he is yeah. begins to warp their understanding of what they're even called for. Yeah. And so, like, you know, it's, it's not just getting beat up by the middle schoolers. It's not just, you know, those of us who have experienced, like, childhood sexual abuse. It's not, it's not just that. Yeah. It's, not the, it's not the thing that happened. It's the world that that thing created in our heads yeah. that begins to ask, make us ask the question, like, well, did God really say? Like, what am I? Yeah, then? yeah. And I think it's so powerful that you said, like, it, it's the world that it creates in us because this one moment in Scripture creates a, it unravels, like, generations of trauma. And that gen, that one generation of trauma is restored in the life and redeemed in the life of Jesus Christ. But how many generations are there between Adam and Eve and Jesus? A lot Proof of us text me all, but I think it's 42 generations. Yeah. And everyone wants to be like, I said yes to Jesus. So I am healed. And it's like Adam and Eve were physically with God. And it took 42 generations to heal the trauma that they'd experienced. Right. And we have to remember, like, we have to stop oversimplifying. And I think sometimes we're oversimplifying because we don't actually want to do life with God. We just want the benefits of his power so we can go about our business. 
you know, God, just give me this, heal me so I can do this, fix me so I can do that, give me insight so I can do that, give me power so I can do that. But like the middle ground, that's where you get to know who God is. The middle ground, that's where you get to know who you are. The middle ground is where you get to figure out what kind of life you want to live. And if we don't ask ourselves why am I healing? We won't ever actually get to healing because some of us are trying to heal so people like us more, which is actually just feeding into our trauma of abandonment. Yep. Do you want to heal so that you can experience life as you've called it to, as you as you've been called to experience it, or do you want to heal so that you can subconsciously feed your trauma of feeling like no one likes you? Right. I say this. I said this the other day. It is really hard to heal from trauma. When you care so much when people think about you. It is really hard to heal, to heal from trauma when you care so much about what people think about you. Because healing from trauma requires that you tell the truth. And the truth doesn't always get accepted by people around you. Right? That yeah. means that and the enemy always hides the deepest pain and the most embarrassing and mundane moments. And if you're too afraid to be honest about what hurts you, you're not going to get access to that healing. You're just not, right? And so I think he does that because not only do you have to deal with, like, being honest about the fact that you're in pain, you also have to be honest about the fact uh, that, like, whatever caused your pain was, like, pretty embarrassing. (laughs) You know, like, you have to be willing to endure that embarrassment and endure the reality that people might think it wasn't that bad. You you have to be able to... like go through that to get access to healing healing only happens for things that we're honest about the process can't move forward unless we're honest right and a lot of us are afraid to be honest about what's hurt us and so we're like being dishonest about what what has hurt us and then we want the process to move so quickly just yeah. because we say the name of jesus yeah you can't heal from like a fake wound and end up with like a real breakthrough yeah and that's not how that works yeah but it's really easy to kind of skip over, to your point, the small thing. Like some people know my story. I have, I've experienced what um, Kobe's book goes into talking about acute, complex uh, trauma. Shameless plug. Why am I like this? Coming out in April um, <laughs> of 2023. Um, I've experienced things that many people would very like. They they look at it and like, oh, that's trauma. I've been beaten up by gangs. I I have a history of childhood. Um, sexual abuse I have experienced a type of racism that people many people don't think exist to this day there's all these really horrible things that you can point to as to like why did I get here but the things that I am working through in therapy are more like "Mm, I remember being in second grade and tracing letters or whatever writing sentences and my teacher said you've got to be the smartest young man I've ever met with a dumb person's handwriting trauma and you know (laughs) and i find myself i've uh our first year of marriage um i was at work and going through a lot at work and kobe came home one um one day one of many days where i had a panic attack i was in my closet upstairs with blankets over me having a panic attack when she called me down the thing that i was having a panic attack about i sent an email and i missed a period now, we could talk about me getting beat up. We could, t- we could talk about them, you know, all the horrible things that happened and how you end up in that spot. <clears throat> but the truth is, that panic attack, all the shame and the embarrassment at 25, had a lot to do with a, a throwaway statement my second grade teacher said. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's real out here. Yeah. And the things that, the things that people say, the things that happen to us. Let me say this. Let me go back. Trauma is not what happened to you. Trauma is what happened to you and what it created in you. Like the thing that happened to you, the moment that happened to you, what did it create in you? Because guess what? The moment's over, but the effects of the moment you're living with for life, unless you do something about it. Right. And so this is a good conversation. I Mm. I think that if there's anything I want you to leave this with is that trauma is anything that has a lasting negative effect on you. I tell my clients all the time, any negative moment that makes you make a promise to yourself, that's trauma. 
I will never let myself be in a position where I A, B, C, D, E, F, G again. I'm never asking anybody for help. I'm never letting anyone. Any negative moment that makes you make a vow to yourself, that is trauma and it deserves healing. You deserve healing. You deserve the opportunity to be free of the restrictions you put on yourself because of the negative things you've experienced, right? You deserve a life where you understand that bad things happen, but bad things don't shape how you exist in the world, right? And that's what an unintentional effect of trauma is like. We begin to make guardrails around our life based on only the negative things, right? Like we, our life somehow like slowly becomes morphed and defined only by the worst moments of our lives. And like there's a world where your life is molded and shaped by the best moments of your life too, right? But we have to be able to see like that. So part of why I love trauma therapy, I know I'm like going a little over time. It's but your podcast. You you know, who's who going to come in and stop us? Who's going to chip me, boo? Um, I think that one of my favorite things about trauma is when you find out how you got there, you can find out how to get back. Yeah. Right. And that's what scripture shows us. It's like I can I'm telling you what the lies that you believe about yourself, about your other people, about your worthiness, about what God thinks about you. Literally, it sounds so simple. What is the opposite of that lie? The opposite of that lie is actually what you were designed to exist in. We see that in scripture. Like there is a grand reversal. Every single thing that God blesses Adam and Eve with, there is a. a the very opposite of it is what they begin to operate in after they begin to believe the lie of the enemy. So like, if you feel like no one loves me, it's probably because if you were seen, people would love you a lot. Come on. Right. If you feel like you can't do the job, it's actually probably because you were designed to do the job. Right. And like, that's something that's carried me like in, in marriage and motherhood and even doing this work. Like, what does it look like for me to have anxiety and struggle with depression and have had a past suicide attempt, but I'm over here being a trauma therapist. And there are days, you know, there are days where I'm like, I'm not cut out for this. I can't do this. And every time I say that, I'm like, no, I was designed for this. I was made for this. The difference, and this is what it means for God to turn everything for your good, there's a difference between being an expert at something because you learned about it and there's a difference between being an expert at something because you've experienced it, right? A lot of us think that because we've experienced it, it disqualifies us from serving people in that place. But actually, God's saying, because you've experienced that pain, you are now an expert in a way that no one else can be an expert. When God, when the enemy tries to disqualify us with our pain, God qualifies us with it. You know, yeah. Um, but part of that qualification is being honest about what we've experienced and letting God give us healing. Um, and, you know, in the following episodes, we'll talk more about the logistics of what that healing looks like. Yeah. And um, I think the best way to end this is probably the way that God sort of begins the narrative after Genesis three, the end of it. Um, God takes away their ability to live forever and he, quote unquote, kicks them out of the garden. That's the way that we've kind of heard that story. Yeah. Um, if you read the text, God says that he is taking them away from the garden because he doesn't want us to live forever in this broken place. Mm. So he said, better that, like, I'm, I'm going to take you out of this place because if you stay here, you'll live forever. But I don't want you to live forever. Like this. This hurt. So the beginning starts with maybe leaving a place of something that feels safe. Yeah. But is actually poisonous. Yeah. It and looks like starting over. Yeah. It looks like starting new yeah. and maybe leaving, you know, leaving the, the, the safe place where you feel like you can live forever yeah. into a place where you don't think you can make it because God's actually trying to lead you into a place where you can actually be healed. Yeah. And I think, through the next few episodes, we'll explore what that looks like. Yeah. It is a grace that God is not, you know, leaving you to be tortured in the same place where you have been wounded or have wounded other people. Yeah. If he's inviting you out, it's a grace, you know. We can go on forever and ever and ever. Yep. But... You guys, like every day in my life. <laughs> we are so glad to be back. So excited that we are sharing the virtual <laughs> stage again. 
I'm so excited that you guys can actually see us having this conversation. Um, you guys, my book, Why Am I Like This? How to Break Cycles, Heal from Trauma, and Restore Your Faith comes out April 4th, 2023. For me, part of healing is being honest, right? I don't share everything because not everyone deserves everything, but I'll tell you what, this book, I truly believe, can and will be a New York Times bestseller. And I feel like you got to say some things out loud to increase your own faith and to invite other people into that faith. So your job is to buy two or three or five copies of this book. Two or three hundred. To share it with the people that you know <laughs> need it. To share it with the people you know want healing, have been clamoring for it, but just can't grasp it and take hold of it. This book is going to usher them into so much healing. I truly, truly believe that. Also... If you want to join an amazing community of people who are ready to heal, to laugh, to grow, to cry together, join my membership community. It's a mental health and faith membership community called the Inner Circle with Kobe. Um, you can join for free for three months using the code CircleFam. All this stuff is going to be in the show notes. Also, you guys, I expanded my practice. So I have a new clinician who works with me. Her name is Maria. Maria is amazing. She provides therapy and therapeutic coaching um, to people anywhere. So reach out to her. Um, you can get the link in the show notes as well. She provides services in English and in Spanish. So if you've been like, I want to work, work with Kobe or someone who uh, is similar to her or kind of uh, see th things in the same vein, then Marie is your girl. Book a session with her. And I think that's it. Well, also, you know, coming in January, February, she's going to have another therapeutic coach, um, which is me. <laughs> turn up um and so yeah uh we're we're adding a lot more uh resources to the practice because kabe is amazing but she can only see so many people in one day yeah and true. so if you want a super amazing expert um but they're fully booked and so you'll take someone else i'm the someone else <laughs> All right, you guys, thank you so much for your time. And we'll Jesus talk to you door. soon. Someone just rang our doorbell. Um, until the circle comes back around. Yes, until the circle comes back around. Bye, y'all. Peace. <laughs>